Hi, and welcome to Fuel Podcast. My name is Alena, and I'm CEO and co-founder of Fuel Finance, and at Fuel, we make finance fun for all founders. And today, our guest will be Marcus, uh, who is CEO and co-founder of Bolt, who has already more than 100 million customers in 45 countries and backed by Sequoia Capital, Fidelity, Whalerock, and other funds. And... Hi, Marcus. Uh, I hope you will tell our today your financial secrets and insights to all startup founders. So how are you? Doing very well. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. I will start with a short question. I know that uh, your revenue in 2022 was more than 1 billion euros. So what uh, financial metrics and operational metrics do you track now in such a huge business, and how often do you do this? Uh, so, uh, first of all, Bolt operates across five different verticals. So we have our ride-sharing business, we have food delivery from restaurants and from grocery stores, uh, and we have rental products from uh, e-bikes to scooters to cars. So obviously, each of the businesses has somewhat of a different uh, financial framework for how they operate, because some of these are asset-heavy businesses where you need to buy the assets yourself and have them on your balance sheet. And some of them are just purely digital marketplaces where you don't have sort of large financial obligations like that. So because of it, we need to operate with a bit different framework. But on a company level, we have a few North Stars that are common across the board. Uh, and ultimately, what we try to boil everything down to is ROI. So generally, what we would look at is how much money are we investing and how much gross bookings uh, do we generate on the platform. And in our case, gross bookings is basically an analogy for GMB for marketplaces, for example. So we look at how much are consumers actually spending on the platform. So that usually is the easiest North Star metric that we try to uh, use across all the business lines. And how do you often you t do you track a return on investment, for example, and also GMV? So do you check it on a weekly, monthly basis? So especially in your case, when you are a CEO. So uh, the operational managers on the ground monitor this pretty much real time. So, so we have status updates and everything happening every couple of even hours if something is out of the ordinary. Uh, but uh, I generally look at it every week. So I go through every vertical uh, and every country on a weekly basis and I look at the trends. Uh, how is the top line GMV growing and how much are we investing into that business and do the ratios actually make sense or not? So do you have uh, some dashboard to track all this information in one place? And also additional will be question about your management system. So do you have some executive meetings, strategic sessions, or any other types like of meetings? So how do you implement maybe KPIs or cares in your business? Sure. So on the tooling side, uh, we still rely on Looker quite a bit uh, for creating the dashboards. And uh, we still run a lot of things in Google Sheets. So despite us trying to uh, find some dedicated tools for it, it's been really difficult to find something that works for uh, all of the different business lines and is easily shareable and customizable. And um, that's where still we're stuck despite spending millions of dollars trying to find a better tool. Uh, and in terms of the operations internally, uh, we uh, have a lot of different um, reviews. So each of the business lines has their own management team. So how we operate is that effectively each of the five uh, business units has their own executive management, uh, they have their own PL, uh, and they are the ones that monitor the business every day and they have weekly meetings for that as well. And then on the group management level, uh, we then review the business performance of each of the subunits usually every month. Sounds, sounds interesting. And But this is current situation. When you already have mm -hmm. huge team, you have huge management team, many financial people, I believe. So going back to the first days of both, so mm -hmm. uh, in first years, How was financial management done and also by whom? Well, it was mainly done by me. So uh, I was just pulling all the numbers uh, from our internal systems and uploading them into Google Sheets and making the budgets there. And it actually worked uh, for many, many years. I, I think the company was doing about 10 million of revenue and I was still the primary person who was uh, making the financial planning uh, just alone in Google Sheets um, with the support of some of our country managers and the uh, head of our retailing business. Um, so it actually can work for quite a long time uh, if you have a very capable team and everybody's aligned on what are the metrics that you need to follow. Hmm. That's, that's, that's very impressive. So you was the person who was responsible for all this information, financial information in your business. And how about... 
financial mistakes. So did you make any financial mistakes? And maybe you have some recommendations for startup founders. So what financial mistakes uh, can be avoided? Um, th there's, of course, uh, a lot of mistakes I've seen different companies do, but uh, the two very common ones I see that uh, their internal systems are not very good. So what we did actually was uh, was looking back was a great choice. So we invested quite a bit in our own internal uh, financial systems uh, that were custom built, that were monitoring the business on a real-time basis. So we knew exactly how much uh, money our customers paying for taxi rides in each of the cities we were operating in and so on. So we could basically real-time uh, uh, generate these reports and know exactly how much revenue was happening in each of the countries from the internal systems. Uh, and then we built a very basic export functionality, which in the beginning was just CSVs. So you could just export the CSV with your weekly, monthly, or whatever way you wanted to slice it in terms of time frame, upload it into Google Sheets, and then we were making just custom reports based on that. So uh, we were actually running like that for a long time. And uh, at least for us, uh, that made a lot of sense. Uh, so that's something I'm generally recommending startups to uh, spend adequate time on. Um, and then, of course, if you want to, you can, you know, instead of taking out the CSV, you can instead integrate with like a proper financial uh, planning software. And then you don't need to make those views in Google Sheets yourself, but you can actually have uh, something a lot more nicer and automated. So, so that's one mistake. The other one I very commonly see is that most startups don't get their team aligned on what are the most important metrics. And uh, one can always make the argument that uh, their business is very complicated. But from what I've seen, there is no business that's that complicated, that you can't boil it down to uh, two or three KPIs. Uh, and that's something that we did really well. So from day one, we emphasized the whole company that we first and foremost care about uh, GMV growth and we care about ROI. So we really had the whole company very focused on how much are we spending money and how much are we generating in top line. And that was uniform across all the departments, all the business lines, and uh, that created a lot of clarity. So uh, am I right that you were like transparent with all your team about all this metrics? So you share this metrics on a monthly basis mm -hmm. with the team so they can easily understand so what impact they create? Absolutely. So each of the business unit heads has their own P&L. So they know precisely real time how much uh, volume they're doing in their city and their business line and, and what the financials are. Uh, and even on the whole company level, we have all hands every two weeks. And uh, even now, where the company is about 4,000 people, we go through our, um, our main metrics uh, on every all hands session as well. That's, that sounds great. I think it's really important for all team members have this like understanding what is going on in the business. And it's Absolutely. great to hear, to hear that you have this transparency. Uh, well, it's always a trade-off, right? I mean, like uh, it's a competitive industry. So obviously, once in a while, competitors try to uh, steal some of that uh, data from you. Uh, but uh, we've generally seen that uh, this transparency is a good trade-off because it's much better to have that. But then uh, actually all of your thousands of, of people know how the company is doing and they can prioritize their actions. And especially with this, uh, about this competition uh, you know, on your market, so with all your other competitors. So do you have some specific financial strategies So based on that because you, ha you are like great in this competitive market? Do you have maybe some strategy about your costs, about your unit economics, so something special because of such your current market situation? Uh, our philosophy from day one has been that uh, to win in this industry, you need to be a cost leader. So uh, what we did from uh, really the first days of the company uh, was to decide that we would be the most efficient transport operator in the world so that we would keep our costs really low and we always monitor the costs as a percent of our GMV. So what it means is that if your, let's say your costs to run the business are 5% of GMV, that means that if you charge your drivers, let's say 10%, uh, you will have a very healthy 5% margin. So um, uh, what we saw many of our competitors do was that they had an extremely high cost base. So it maybe was 15 or even 20% of GMV. And therefore they had to take a very high commission from every trip as well. And that made them just uh, under competitive against us. So uh, that was really our philosophy from day one that, yes, this is a tech business and absolutely you need to have great technology as well. But uh, the way to win is that you need to be uh, very strong on the cost side and then be the cost leader. And I think in many ways, it's the same philosophy from what we've seen in e-commerce, for example, and, and something that Amazon has been following for the last 30 years as well. Yeah, I, I know about Amazon. They have many different different rules about cost efficiency. And... Uh... 
one more question about mm -hmm. this cost efficiency because I also saw the information to you that during the COVID you had zero layoffs. Is it also a secret because you have this cost efficiency strategy from the day one? Or maybe do you have some cash flow management tips for early stage founders? So how to manage finance during the crisis? Well, uh, first of all, th there's no way we could have uh, got through with um, of COVID without any layoffs unless we had this very strong frugality culture from uh, the first day of the COVID. So th that was really something that uh, gave us the foundation to even be possible uh, to go through that because our revenues during COVID dropped by 85%. Uh, but uh, the other things we did was uh, quite simple. Uh, on one hand, we looked at where can we generate revenues very quickly. So if your core business is down 85%, we realized that we can pivot and put more emphasis on food delivery because people were at home and ordering food, even when they weren't uh, going out and taking rides. So we were able to focus a lot of our teams on that and start to generate revenue from that quite quickly. The second thing we did was that we uh, obviously exhausted any possible means of fundraising. Uh, so we went out to new investors and existing investors, and we were able, uh, were able to raise some uh, additional funding even in those tough times um, to have some more certainty of having more cash in the bank. And then the third thing uh, was that we did a thorough review of which costs we can cut. And uh, what most companies realized was that they had too many people. So they just let go 20, 30, 40% of their staff. Uh, we realized that actually we were already so frugal that there was no people to cut. So we actually did zero layoffs. And instead, what we did was that we lowered people's salaries uh, by 20% uh, for a few months. And that was another thing that uh, enabled us to get through it. And uh, of course, uh, the more senior people and, and the top management uh, opted in for even much bigger salary cuts. So the founders, for example, went through the crisis with, uh, with zero pay. Um, so we did a lot of activities like that to reduce the burn and when we needed it to be done. And how much time uh, did you need to uh, renew your revenue during the COVID, so like to pre-COVID level? It was actually quite a fast rebound. I think it was about um, seven, eight months until we rebounded back to our previous levels. And uh, that was then a combination of the retailing business starting to bounce back and also food delivery growing to new records. Sound, sounds great. So you were able to renew all the salary so after this period, yes? Exactly. So I, I think we were in this very brutal cost cutting mode for about four months. And then we gradually started coming back to the previous levels. So that's that's a secret. So to make these decisions very fast about about the cost. So you have this time to survive. Yes. That's Absolutely. Scary. That's the other thing I see that many founders just don't want to make these unpleasant decisions uh, in the start. They try to postpone them. And uh, that's often the worst choice to do. Yeah, it's, it's too late. And uh, talking about also your previous experience, one more time, going back to first year. So you t you told about uh, managing finance by your own for a very long period of time. But when did you hire your first dedicated financial person or maybe CFO in your team? So and why did you why did you decide to do that? Because like you managed everything by your own. So um, at some point we realized that just um, uh, the finance team was already growing into dozens of people and my um, co-founder and my brother Martin, who was running the finance team at the time, wasn't uh, professional in that. He didn't enjoy it the most. So we realized we needed to bring in a senior person to do that properly. And uh, that was about five years ago when we first um, hired the, the CFO. And uh, that obviously freed up a lot of time for me and, and the other members of the team to focus on we could actually uh, do much better in, in terms of uh, how do we run the product and the actual business strategy of, of the company uh, and not necessarily looking into all the financial details that much. So it was uh, your company already exists nine years. So it was like five years ago. So four years he was without CFO person. Yes. Uh, so during that time, it was me and my uh, co-founder, my brother, who were running the finance team. So pretty efficient and pretty long period of time. And now uh, what is the role of CFO? So is CFO also responsible for fa fundraising, for example? So or what key responsibilities do you see uh, for CFO? Absolutely. So um, first of all, as you said, it, it's fundraising and investor relations, uh, because by now Bolt has raised more than a billion euros of funding from more than 100 investors. So just making sure that we give them the information they need and then we keep great relations with them is, is part of the mandate. Uh, the second thing is uh, actually preparing the company to go public. 
So we uh, want to be ready for that in two years. And there's uh, obviously a lot to do in terms of internal reporting and, and so on that we need to get in a, in a good shape. Uh, third, it's uh, capital allocation and financial planning. So that's a joint responsibility between me, the CFO, and the heads of the business. But uh, the central finance team needs to plan how are we spending tens of millions of dollars every year across the group? How much are we spending on food delivery or ride hailing or scooters? Um, and how do we build the correct financial frameworks to, to distribute capital in the most optimal way? Um, and then on top of that, all the traditional areas the CFO would carry in terms of tax, uh, treasury, uh, accounting, etc. I mean, that's pretty normal for, for every company. And uh, talking about uh, your uh, experience with fundraising, so you raised <laughs> much more, so you raised many, many different investments from different funds. So what would be your top recommendations for early stage founders about fundraising? What is the best strategy? I don't know, like bootstrap during the first years of fundraise as soon as possible and especially about the process of fundraising what what can you recommend to early stage founders uh, what worked really well for us was uh, first of all to bootstrap so the best fundraising strategy is that you don't need to fundraise at all uh, and that's what we did uh, so we were operating the company on a very slim budget uh, the first four years uh, in fact, we raised less than $2 million of funding and we built the company to more than $10 million of revenue with that. So it's very rare anywhere in the world to see a tech company have those kind of ratios. And um, that's what gave us a lot of flexibility. So we could decide uh, when to raise and at what, uh, what price to raise it. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that obviously one needs to be opportunistic and then monitor what's going on in the markets as well. So like the environment we had in 2021, when capital was relatively affordable, I was encouraging all startups to, to raise as much money as possible because you never know uh, how long those times are going to last. Uh, and very clearly now in 2022 and 2023, capital is significantly more expensive and, and therefore startups need to be more careful in how they spend and, and when to raise funding. So one uh, needs to pay attention to the macroeconomic environment as well. And talking about macroeconomic environment, so do you make some specific decisions in your company about this, like according to the situation of possible financial downturn? Did you change your financial strategy or did you make some very specific decisions based, based on this situation? On the fundamental strategy, we haven't really changed anything for the last uh, nine years since we started operating in 2013. Um, and that has a few very basic principles. Uh, we always want to be the cost leader in our category, uh, be the most efficient operator. And that means we always need to keep costs under control, whether it's uh, 2021 or it's 2023. So that, that hasn't really changed. Uh, the part that has changed is that um, in our business, we have a lot of variable costs. And for us, the biggest variable cost is marketing. So we can very easily invest $500 million a year into acquiring customers and acquiring drivers. Uh, and that's a cost that we can very quickly control. So um, in the times when capital was more affordable, um, we were very aggressively investing and, and burning hundreds of millions of dollars a year to grow the company at the record pace. Uh, now in the new environment, we're rather dialing that back. We're going for profitability. Um, as we were actually doing the first four years of the company. So we're investing modestly in terms of customer acquisition, um, but we want to get the company to a profitable state over the next 12 months. So now you're not profitable yet. No. So over the last two years, as, as mentioned, we raised funding. We very aggressively uh, deployed that into acquiring customers. Uh, and now we're returning back to profitability as, as we had in the periods before that. And uh, you mentioned about this marketing, huge marketing costs, and you said that you analyze this costs in detail. So how do you analyze this cost? So what what really matters with uh, marketing budgets? I don't know. Do you track also return on investment on marketing budgets or do you have some specific metrics uh, for marketing? Absolutely. So usually our rule of thumb is that it's okay to spend about 1% of the budget on uh, analyzing it. So back of the napkin, if we're spending $500 million a year on uh, customer acquisition, then it's okay that we would spend $5 million uh, a year on analyzing how that spend is exactly allocated and, and what effect does it have. Um, and that means we have a very large team. So there is dozens of people uh, in terms of analysts and, and we're building great software for them in-house in 
of how to monitor all of this spend and figure out where to deploy it. Uh, so, so first of all, again, as mentioned, uh, we have five business lines. So you can deploy it into either promoting food delivery or scooters or rides. That's one level of complexity. The other one is all the countries and cities. So are you going to be investing it into Kiev or London or Nairobi? Uh, all of those have very different dynamics as well. Uh, so you do got to take all of these factors into account. Um, and then separately, we try to look at it in two ways. So one is the short-term effect. And that is usually quite easy to monitor. So you can see that we put money into Facebook or we give a customer's discounts and we see immediately how much new customers and new trips and uh, how much new GMV are we generating in that market. But then the other thing is that you got to take into account second order effects and, and other factors that don't show up in the financial data immediately. So for example, you might have a regulatory change that's about to happen in a country that might remove half the drivers or it might actually grow the pool of drivers a lot. And then that's going to impact your business. Or you might have a new competitor into that market, uh, which is going to make your financials much worse over the next year. So uh, you do got to take all these factors into account as well, and not only rely on the short-term financials, but take the bigger picture into planning as well. Hmm. That's, that sounds very interesting and sounds also like very data-driven company yeah. with different information to track. And uh, talking about like uh, maybe some insights, uh, if my question will be, if you track some information of any public company's data, maybe you try to listen to some earning calls of other companies, maybe other competitors, what are these companies and um, what valuable information you can get from such uh, companies, public companies' data? Sure. Um, so again, this is a hyper competitive industry. In some ways, even you can say this is the most competitive industry tech has seen over the last 10 years, uh, because companies in retailing and food have raised more than $100 billion combined. So it's really massive amounts. And uh, what that means is that there's a lot uh, for us to learn from them as well. So we're constantly monitoring both the private and the public competitors across ride hailing, across scooters, food delivery. Um, and separately, we also look at many players in similar industries. So, for example, in travel with uh, Booking.com or in terms of e-commerce like Amazon, uh, there's a lot of similarities between marketplaces um, across different industries. So we can learn what's working for them and try to apply that to our business as well. Hmm. And interesting that you track also these marketplaces. So what what do you learn from Amazon, for example? You already mentioned about cost efficiency. Do you have some like one, two tips what you learned from Amazon and Booking.com? Uh, so we've actually been looking at um, three or four different initiatives over the last year that, that they're doing and now analyzing whether we should uh, do them uh, somehow in the Bolt ecosystem as well or not. Uh, one of them, for example, is that uh, Booking.com has a very popular loyalty program, a Genius, and uh, we're assessing whether we should go down that path. Or um, Amazon obviously has Amazon Prime being very famous and well celebrated, uh, which is a different approach and you can go down the subscription route. But both of them serve a similar goal of how do you lock in your uh, most um, spending, the, the most profitable customers, uh, and make a product for them that they will really love and then keep on returning to you without even looking at your competitors. So um, there's two very different approaches there and we're trying to assess what is working for, for different players in different industries before we commit to one path. Uh, so that's just one of the more recent examples. Interesting. And uh, my last question will be, uh, you already shared many different insights about cost efficiency and about planning, budgeting, but uh, what will be your top three recommendations for early stage startup founders in managing their finance? Uh, well, first of all, I'd say that uh, companies just need to manage their finances. <laughs> I'm, I'm still surprised by how many startups I see that uh, basically don't do any financial management at all. <laughs> and uh, that is just horrible. Uh, even though they might have raised a few million dollars, they have a very poor visibility of how much uh, they're even burning each month and how much run they have, they have left. So that's just level one. Um, then second thing I see very commonly that I mentioned earlier is that uh, founders don't really take the time to figure out which metrics are important. So they try to track 10 metrics at the same time, and it's not clear for them or for the rest of the team which are the metrics that really matter. 
what are the trade-offs between them and therefore which one should they prioritize over others and uh, that's something that is really worthwhile to do to make sure that you have a few north star metrics ideally it would be just one or two numbers and then you can uh, rally the whole company behind a few numbers and and uh, that really simplifies things a lot uh, and third, I, I think that it's uh, really worthwhile to think through the uh, processes and then the tools. Because what we found is that if you make something inconvenient, then people don't use it. And uh, if you lower the barriers and you make it very simple for people to access data, then they will use it 10 times more than without it. And uh, that's something that we, we constantly see even now. So for example, we're in inter internally using this uh, Looker tool and uh, the frequency was super high. So we saw that some of the managers were using it like 20 times a day to monitor all their metrics. And then uh, we had some database uh, scaling issues there and it uh, became slower. So it uh, took like one or two minutes to load the view. And we immediately saw that people started using the tool so much less, even though the delay was maybe one minute. So uh, you have a lot of signals like that, that if you make tools easier to use, people will use them much more. Thank you so much. I hope that this, uh, these recommendations will be very valuable for all founders and they can avoid many financial mistakes. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today and uh, may the profits be with you. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. See you. Bye. -bye.